What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan from Lathrop High School in California and morganapteaching.com. I've got here another free AP lecture for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know to help you do your best on the AP test. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you find this video helpful. us pick up where we left off. We picked up where we left off in period three. And period three is post class player. Give me those years, we gotta know these. Six, six, so that is six hundred C E to fourteen fifty C E. And what comes next by the way, just out of curiosity. Early modern, Early modern era, right. Okay, cool. So we left off on Islam and how it spread to various trade routes. Um, so it spread by conquest to North Africa, to Persia, to Europe even, to the Middle East, to the Delhi Sultanate, the Turks who spread it further, but also spread by trade in Muslim diasporas uh, to the east coast of Africa, to uh, uh, Oceania, in Indonesia, the other parts of Southeast Asia here. It, it gets quite far by trade. So Islam is all over the place in uh, period three. <clears throat> There's a couple other diasporas, by the way, that take place, besides just uh, Islam. Jewish. Yeah, exactly. With the Jewish diaspora, that's actually from period two, but they continue to spread. Now, they go across the Mediterranean and on the Silk Road, but where do the bulk of these Jewish people go to? Europe. They go to Europe, right. Specifically, like, Western and Eastern um, uh, Europe here. That's where most of the Jewish diaspora goes to. So we already have this Muslim merchant diaspora. Muslim diaspora. <clears throat> and of course we've got places like Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia, East Africa. Um, just, just to have it up here again, where did Islam spread to via conquest? India. Okay, cool. India. Where else? Central Asia. Central Asia. North Africa, Middle East, that's good enough, and a little bit of Europe too, from Spain and the Balkans, all over that actually. All right, then we had Jewish diaspora. They're going to spread to the Mediterranean, uh, to Europe. This is the biggest chunk. Those those future Ashkenazi Jews, and also a little bit along the Silk Road, but not not too much. <clears throat> And there's one more that you probably don't know now, but you'll remember if I mention it, I bet. Oh, you do. The Chinese diaspora as well. Hmm? Exactly, yeah. So we haven't talked about China yet, right? We didn't get to that yet? 
No. <clears throat> I mean, this is like the golden age of imperial China. This is when they start that tribute system. They start that um, uh, uh, whole middle kingdom idea. Uh, they, they're the most influential and powerful they're ever going to be, at least compared to other states. So they see fit to spread um, their trade and power um, by setting up Chinese communities throughout the world, at least in the Pacific. And so one specific example of Chinese settling quite far away from China permanently is going to be um, in Singapore here. So we have Chinese merchants and naval holdings spread. All right, and those are the major diasporas that are going to go on here. <coughs> Do you guys remember the uh, word that described like basically the Muslim world? Because by the way, this is a large amount of regions. The Muslims have North Africa, they're into East Africa. I forgot to mention that up here, by the way, in their trade. Oh, I did, I did mention that. West Africa is what I didn't mention. They're in West Africa, East Africa, North Africa. Uh, they're in uh, Persia, the Middle East, Arabia, parts of Europe, in Central Asia, in India, Indonesia. All over the place. What was the word to describe this area? Dar al Islam. Yeah, Dar al Islam is like just means like the Islamic world. So if you ever hear it, that's what it is. Is that all ruled by one person? No. No, it's not. And in fact, let's stick with governments for right now, because we have to talk about China and stuff too. But before we get there, there's a new type of government that shows up here um, with the uh, uh, Islamic world here and in, inside of Dar al Islam. We talked briefly about them yesterday. What are my two new forms of government I got here? Caliphates and Sultanates, yes. <clears throat> now the difference is a Caliphate is ruled by a Caliph, and they have the power to uh, enforce and change both religious law and political law. Can we think of a Caliphate? Abbasid Caliphate's a big one. Umayyad Caliphate, exactly. Those are two examples of caliphates, right? And the Abbasid Caliphate's a pretty, pretty powerful one. By the way, what was the capital of the uh, Abbasid Caliphate? I told you guys yesterday. Baghdad. Baghdad, yeah. That's their cultural, economic, and, and central center. Okay. If a caliphate can change and make political and religious law, what can a sultanate do? Or a sultan do? So it's run by a sultan. Enforce the change. What? I mean, enforce religious law, but can't change it and change political Right, okay, cool. So they can enforce religious law, but they can't change it. But they can change, of course, political law. So who's like more powerful overall, caliphs or sultans? Caliphs. Caliphs, right, because they can change both. Excellent. What's an example of a sultanate? Delhi. Delhi. Delhi sultanate, right. Most caliphs, by the way, are Arabic, and most sultans are, well, a lot of sultans anyway, are going to be like Turkish or other non-Arab types of Muslim. <clears throat> or Persian, even. Okay, um, sweet. Those are those types of governments. What about, well, we'll do China next, actually, because that makes sense. So we have talked a lot about um, the Byzantine Empire and the Delhi Sultanate and the Caliphates, right? Those are some major... Uh, uh, civilizations. We still have to talk about feudalism in Europe and Japan. We have to talk about China. We have to talk about the Mongols. And then we'll talk about city states. So, in China, you want to just adjust that slightly to catch a little bit more of this? Thank you. Uh, in China, I've got a. What, what dynasty ended in the classical era? This, this big one that unified the, uh, the Chinese in this big state. The Han? Yep, the Han dynasty, right? That lasted almost 400 ish years. That was, a, that was a big one. There's kind of like a mini warring states period after the Han Dynasty. However, it's eventually reunited under a uh, dynasty called the Su Dynasty. And I'm probably butchering these, but oh well. And that's in the late 600s. Now this Su Dynasty doesn't last that long. What it does do though is it, it ends that warring states period. <clears throat> so it ends... I would just say it reunifies China under a dynasty. That's what I'll put. Reunifies China. 
They're also quite famous for their large scale, in fact, biggest large scale, still used today, infrastructure projects that they engaged in to connect northern and central China, the economies in, there, in those regions. The Grand Canal? Yeah, the Grand Canal, right. So they have this large infrastructure project, and that, of course, is the Grand Canal. Still used today. <clears throat> and that connects what was northern China and central China with one extremely, like, almost thousand mile long uh, canal. That makes it easier for people to move and goods to move. So that's an overall improvement. <clears throat> All right, doesn't last that long, though. The next one is one you'll probably remember. That is the Tang Dynasty. And they go from roughly the 700s to the about 900s. Now, these guys are a lot more famous because they did a couple controversial things. First thing they do, though, not that this is controversial, they reestablish the lasting imperial system. I believe there's no more prolonged periods of warring states anymore. This is just going to be the dynasty that takes over. For the most part, it's dynasty after dynasty. There will be brief periods of conflict, but no like substantial multi-hundred year warring states periods anymore. So they do that. They're also going to be the first um, dynasty to expand China west. So most Chinese empires or dynasties at this point are pretty much centered around this area here, this region. All right, remember we got the Himalayan mountains here, and we've got like desert here. So there's kind of like a, a, a small channel you can go through. So these, uh, these members of the Tang dynasty, they're going to conquer south into what is now southern China and Vietnam. And they're also going to conquer west under this little thin little pass here out into Central Asia. And so they're going to start conquering um, non-Chinese people out to the west, like uh, more Turkish type people. And they actually run into the Caliphate, by the way. Uh, they run head to head with the Umayyad Caliphate, and it's the first battle between, you know, like central or, or like Middle Eastern or European forces uh, and the Chinese. And I believe the Umayyad Caliphate actually won that one. I think. Yeah, I told you about that. They, they had a bunch of mercenaries, the Chinese did, and then the Umayyad Caliphate paid them more, and then the mercenaries just switched sides and the Tang Dynasty lost. And that ended Chinese expansion to the west, and it furthered the Umayyad Caliphate's expansion into the uh, Turkish areas of Central Asia. Why is it important that, the, uh, that we know that the Umayyad Caliphate got to the Turkish people? What did they do to the Turkish people? Convert them to Islam, right. So when the Turkish people start invading shortly after, uh, they're going to be spreading Islam with them. All right. So they expand to the west and south. Expand territory to west and south. So now they're conquering non-Chinese people, non-Han Chinese people. Some Turkish people, some people like west of the uh, Gobi Desert and Himalayas. They're also going to be conquering some Vietnamese people, like I said. And, uh, yeah, so they expand the, uh, the dynasty. Now, there's a new religion for the first time in the Tang dynasty that wasn't there before in the Han. Because, well, it didn't get there yet. Buddhism. Buddhism, right. So I now have Buddhism in China. Okay. That's cool, you know, that's great. Buddhism is appealing because it's egalitarian, it's good for the poor, it's good for women, etc. They have all access to it, that's fantastic. Why would the Chinese central government, the imperial government, not like Buddhism? They went against Confucianism. Yeah, it goes against Confucianism. Why is that important though? Why is Confucianism important to the, uh, to the state? Oh, okay, go, keep going, keep going. Oh, because it messed up the, the social harmony? So like exactly. The whole point of Confucianism is to have one unifying uh, belief system, and that's going to unify the people, and that's going to ha allow them to uh, sort of mimic that family structure. And, and what's that family structure supposed to represent or emulate? State structure. Yeah, the structure of the state, exactly. So, uh, Buddhism in China, and that's going to undermine Confucianism. All right, so Buddhism, think it's going to last there? No. No, they're going to say that it's got to go, right, for philosophical reasons or for, or for political reasons anyway. There's more than that, though. 
This is the reason they're going to say, and it's not that it isn't true, but the Tong Dynasty also needs money. Who is the Tong Dynasty fighting that they're going to need money to, to, uh, to fund? Okay, cool, yeah. They still got the Zhang Yu Confederacy, or at least nomads over here. Are they fighting people in the West? Yeah. Yep, they're fighting the Caliphates and others in the West. Are they fighting people in the South? Yeah. Yep, they're fighting the, uh, the other Chinese and the uh, Vietnamese here in the South. So, they got lots of uh, things to pay for. Who could they target? Buddhists. 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 What type of Buddhism do I find over here in uh, China, in East Asia, by the way? Mahayana. There's two types we talk about. Mahayana. Mahayana, right. What are my two types here? I got Mahayana and Theravada. And Theravada. Uh, which one spread into Southeast Asia? Theravada. Theravada, right. So I have Theravada over here, for the most part, and I have Mahayana over here. That's going to bleed into uh, Japan, too, by the way. What's the difference between the two? They're both Buddhism. Uh, does the Mahayana uh, believe Buddha is a um, divine? Yep. So they believe in the divinity of Buddha. So what are they more likely to have than, uh, than uh, uh, Theravada? Uh, yeah, shrines and statues and maybe even some jewelry and gold and things like that to uh, decorate or celebrate the Buddha. Theravada, by the way, they embrace that hardcore aesthetic life, which is giving up all desires, living that minimalist life, just, you know, meditating, practicing martial arts, etc. Uh, so, uh, Mahayana, however, believes in the Buddha, and they also believe in the uh, uh, Bodhisattvas, the idea that you can reach enlightenment or nirvana, but stay on earth to help others find that. So they're much more about glorifying Buddha and perhaps even decorating their temples and shrines and things, stupas with that. Okay, so what could, um, here we go, so deify Buddha. It's all about the aesthetic life. It's all about it. Okay. What could the Tong Dynasty do to get some money? Attack them. Attack. How? What do you mean attack them? Um, have like a fake reason to kick them out and then <clears throat> it's really for the money? Yeah, so they're gonna, exactly. So this is gonna be the more shady reason, I guess you could say. So they're going to, of course, oppose Buddhism because it it goes against their state system, but also they're going to use it as an opportunity to collect uh, some money here, some gold, jewels, etc. So they're going to claim for sure that it goes against Confucianism. It's got to go. It's some foreign religion that's that's going to cause disunity. Have they had another oh, another religion cause rebellion before or start one? Tao. Yeah, Taoism with the Yellow Turban Rebellion. So they've got some historical context for it. So they say it's going to undermine their stability, and it's going to undermine their political system, so it's got to go. So do you guys remember the, the emperor that decides to get rid of it? Wuzong. Emperor Wuzong. And he officially bans Buddhism and, uh, and has it removed, and in fact violently removed. They destroy temples, they take their stuff, they kill and chase out the monks. Do you guys remember what those laws were called, the system of laws? Edicts on Buddhism, right. So that's in the 800s. So Wuzong, Edicts on Buddhism. Buddhism. As in the 800s. So what happens to Buddhism in China for the most part? <clears throat> it's more or less reduced to almost nothing, right? So down, Buddhism, in China. All right, any questions about the Tang Dynasty? All right, let's do the Song Dynasty. And then we'll do the Mongols. All right, the Song Dynasty. That's gonna go from roughly the 900s to the 1200s. And they get kicked out by the Mongols. But the Song Dynasty and the Tang, but mostly the Song, this is like the golden age of Imperial China. Golden age, Imperial China. This is <clears throat> sort of China at the height of its power. There's not really a large regional power to challenge it. It's pretty much standalone in, the, in, the, in East Asia. The uh, Zhongnu nomads to the north and, and other um, pastoralists are not as organized for most of the duration of the Song Dynasty. So they're really allowed to, uh, to flourish. So I'm going to be, this is of course going to happen. This is an age 
Um, affluence. What's affluence mean again? Lots of prosperity. Prosperity. Yep, they do really well. It's prosperous. All right, so age of affluence, of course, they're going to have high trade. And what are some trade goods that lots of people want, like the caliphates and in India and even Europeans want from these Chinese? Silk and tea. Yep, silk, tea, porcelain. Excellent. In fact, it goes so well for the Chinese that they get a little bit arrogant about how awesome their civilization is, how superior and strong they are compared to everybody else. What's, what's this? I'm not talking about the trading system yet. This idea that they are the best and brightest civilization in the world and all people should look up to their culture and their civilization uh, for, for a model of how to be. The yeah, the Middle Kingdom, right. So don't this idea of the Middle Kingdom. Like they're the biggest and best civilization in the world and all should look to them for, uh, for approval and for uh, uh, like a model. Biggest, best civilization. They're the center of the world. <clears throat> okay. And maintaining that belief that they're the biggest and the best, they actually are going to not just trade with people because in their minds, do they need to trade with people? No. No, in their minds, they have the thing they need. So to trade with China is a privilege. So they're going to require anyone that wants to trade with them to essentially like, I don't want to say beg, they're not going to beg, but they're supposed to like, sort of like pay homage, right? They're basically going to have to offer uh, gifts, bestowals, uh, and basically like kneel down offer gifts and say, please let us trade with you, oh great China. Uh, and either the government officials or the emperor that's receiving these bestowals can essentially agree and give more better things back, kind of as a condescending gesture, uh, or, or say no. So what is that process of having people to kneel down before them, offer gifts in order to trade with the, the great and amazing China? Isn't that the tribute system? Yep, that's the tribute system. That's at least one part of it. You have to uh, ask and offer a bestowal or a gift to trade with China. And again, they thought they had everything they needed, so they're like, whatever. One other part of this tribute system is the surrounding empires and uh, states of China, like the, you know, the areas of Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Japan, Korea, these countries had to basically offer money and gifts to China every year just for the protection slash non-invasion of China. So those are called tribute states. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Okay, good. So they have, of course, you have to beg and, uh, and offer a gift to trade with them, and then they also have some tribute states. So that's number one here. And number two is, of course, the tribute states. And again, those are gifts, gifts and privilege and even money for the Chinese to protect you and to not, well, invade you for the most part. And what are some surrounding states that are doing this? Japan, Japan, Japan Korea, yeah. Southeast Asia, Philippines. Not that the Philippines are some united country, by the way, but those, those parts that are affluent enough do pay tribute to them. Okay, so you know how government, government officials can agree to trade? Yeah. So does the government officials act kind of like the parliament? Like, no, they're more like governors. They're more like governors. Oh. Yeah, I think on the AP test last year they had a short answer question that was like literally a, it was like a, a Turkish, it was like a Turkish pastoralist, and he was like on his knees offering something to this like uh, this uh, Chinese administrator, and like they were like the base of the question was like what is going on here and that that sort of thing. So you had to know about this to answer it, and we killed it. Yeah, yes, uh, everyone for the most part answered it correctly, I believe. So yes, that's the tribute system, and uh, let's go a little further here. So that's. That's basically how well China does at this era. And this is also famous because this is a time when uh, they had a rather barbaric and kind of disgusting practice that began here. So this is where they begin to really see feminine, well, they saw feminine as like a negative thing already, like weak and, 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 and negative. But this was a practice that sort of kept women 
even more dependent on men and stuck inside the home, and that was, of course, foot binding. So they wanted women to have, like, petite, small, like, feet, essentially. And they also, it also served the double purpose of keeping women very dependent on men and kind of almost stuck, like, in those urban household environments. Um, so we, of course, are going to start the foot binding practice. What if they didn't want to do it? Oh, they didn't have to, but then they wouldn't be accepted by some higher class uh, male or anything like that. Huh. So like if you were, there were two things that made you low class and tried at the time. Not having your feet bound and also being uh, tan. Because that meant you couldn't afford to get the foot binding and, and wear the clothes for it and you were outside working. So the idea in China back then, and it still is really, not well, the foot binding, but was to have the foot binding and then the uh, pale skin. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a, a general idea here in, in East and Southeast Asia. The paler you are means you're not outside working, means you're higher class. That's why a lot of Japanese and Chinese would like do a whole bunch of like really pale makeup, skin covering to, to seem even lighter. Like I never see the sun at all because I'm so... Yeah, like in Mulan. All right, and that is, uh, that is the Song Dynasty. Let me make sure I didn't miss any details. Oh, I did, but I, but I looked. This is an era, too, where since they kind of had to restart their dynasties and they had this other religion come in and infiltrate them, they wanted to really reestablish um, Confucianism. So, again, since Buddhism had challenged them and they had kind of fought to remove it, um, they had been inconsistent for a while, they lost their dynast dynastic holdings between the Han and Su dynasties, they really wanted to like reestablish or reassert Confucianism as like the official unifying philo philo no, philosophy or practice in China. And so a guy who wrote a lot about this is a dude named Han Yu. And this is kind of referred to as Neo-Confucianism. So it's really just reasserting the fundamentals of Confucianism. And it also brings back the Confucian examination system. In case you forgot, the Confucian examination system was a Chinese system in which to partake in the government to be a government official, you had to pass this rigorous exam, like multi-day exam, on uh, Confucian ideology and write essays and things like that. So it would take a lifetime, or not a lifetime, a decade's worth of studying and preparation uh, for this test. Does this open up government slots to peasants? No. Why not? Because they don't have education. Exactly, they can't afford to, to get that kind of education to even make it. So you really only got already elite or rich people that are even able to, to take a shot at this. But they keep it for quite a while, anyway. So they bring back that Confucian animation system. Um, in fact, there was a... There was a short answer several years ago, or, a, or an essay, maybe it was a DBQ, and it was like a picture of a bunch of like Chinese men sitting down at these desks that were really spread out with armed guards around them. Like, it was real serious business. Uh, those are the Confucian examinations. Uh, so yeah, very, very serious business taking these exams. Imagine failing it. Yeah, well, I mean, it happened, man. Half people did fail, and they would feel like, uh, they would feel like they dishonored their family, and it was a, it was a big, big, big mess. All right. You're like, imagine you failed the AP test. Oh. At least there's no stakes for that one. All right. You guys got the Song Dynasty Neo Confucianism? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Let's move on to the Mongols. All right, so 1206 to like 1368 ish here, you're going to have the Mongolian Empire. Now the government that they start, called the Khanate, which we'll talk about, those continue on all the way to like the 1700s, at least some, in Central Asia. But I'm talking like Mongolian Empire covering like all of Asia and into the Middle East and Europe a little bit. So that lasts roughly 160, 162 years. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. Okay. Who's to start with? Genghis Khan. Yep, Genghis Khan, even though we spell it and say Genghis for some reason. Now he's a Mongol, and a Mongol are a type of pastoralist from the Central Asian steppes here. 
Now, have these, uh, have these northern pastoralists been a really a thorn in the side of the Chinese for a while? Yeah, yeah they have. And they'll continue to be, by the way. They ain't done yet. Mongols ain't the last ones. I'll get these out of the way. All right. So before I lay out the Mongols here, let's lay out what exists. Oh, crap. We're to West Africa. We'll do West Africa after this, even though I should have done earlier. Um, so I've got... The Abbasid Caliphate and, of course, the other caliphates and sultanates of, um, of the Islamic world. So Abbasid Caliphate. I've got, let's see here, I've got a big chunk of territory. Now, now keep in mind, this isn't an empire, but these are our people. These are Slavic people that were made rich by a bunch of trade between the Vikings and the Byzantine Empire. Do you guys remember the name of this area? No these people? That's the big city state that's in it, no broad. Kevin Rus is correct. I've got, of course, the Turkish tribes of Central Asia. I've got the, what, Delhi Sultanate. And I've got a whole bunch of mountains and a whole bunch of forests that I can't go through. And then, of course, I've got China, the Song Dynasty, and Japan. So most of this is going to be conquered by some horse riders from here. <laughs> yep. That's what it's going to be. So they're going to learn how to, of course, master the horse, which they've done for a while as pastoralists. That's not normal, or that's not abnormal. However, they're the first ones to really master, like, <clears throat> archery from those horses. And that is going to be something that nobody's really able to counter, at least at the time. Gunpowder, while invented by the Chinese, is not going to be developed enough to actually make, like, guns out of. So if I'm, if I'm a bunch of foot soldiers or even cavalry, there's almost nothing I can do to beat these, uh, these, these galloping archers for the most part. Because if you're on foot, I have like no chance for the most part. Like they're, they're moving twice as fast as me. And in fact, if they want to, they can just run over me. Because horses, I don't know if you guys know, horses are freaking huge. Like they just run over people. Um, so it's really hard to catch them. They can sort of run away and shoot at you or pursue you and shoot at you. And like, it's just, it's very, very, very hard for people to beat them. They move very quickly too. So like they can catch you off guard. They can retreat if it's not good for them. All these things make it very hard for them to beat. Are Mongols part of like the Turks? No, they will be though in a second. So what happens here is this uh, particular Khan, this particular leader of the tribe, Genghis or Chinggis Khan, he's going to begin conquering and unifying other Mongols, basically, until at one point he's sort of in control of every Mongolian tribe, or almost all of them. Now, why on earth would he be able to conquer people and then have them join his army and not just go against them or leave? He puts them in groups and like if one person leaves or runs away, then they all die? Exactly. So two things. Number one, he's going to take you and your buddies and he's going to split you up into different groups. If anyone tries to leave that group, he kills the entire group. So that makes sure that the group keeps you in line. Right, because if, if you go missing or whatever, then you're all dead. So if you try and book it, I'm grabbing you and you're coming back. Uh, that's, that's basically how it's going to work. So he's going to incorporate conquered peoples. So he starts with other Mongols. And then who else is closest to him? Turks. Yep, Turks. Other Mongols and Turks. And then next, of course, he's going to set his eyes on China. And that's going to be the big prize. China, uh, in about 1206 or so, is going to go down to um, uh, the Mongols, which are at this point just a whole bunch of Mongolian and Turkish guys on horses with bows and arrows. And they defeat the uh, what they think of as the middle kingdom and best kingdom in the world. They just go down like nothing to the, uh, to the Mongols and the Turks. So China is defeated and made into the Yuan dynasty. Um, by the way, when Genghis Khan dies, his son continues conquests, and his name is Bogade Khan. China goes down, and that's big. Why is that big other than the fact that it was China? Uh, they were using their siege weapons. Yeah, that's going to be it. So if I was going to beat a bunch of Mongols... Do uh, do horses and arrows do very well against like stone castles and forts? No. Not really, unless you're trying to starve people out, which is which is hard to do. It takes a long time. So the Mongols don't know how to siege castles and big cities, right? That's why the Persians are like, ha 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 ha! Oh, you Mongols, 
And like, you know, the caliphates and the Europeans are like, oh, oh, whatever. They can run around on their horses, we'll just sit in our castles and our ports and our cities. The only problem is they conquered China. And since they use people they conquered in their army, they're gonna use the Chinese, and there's a lot of them, Chinese siege workers to build and operate siege weapons. Uh -oh. Because now, the uh, territories here in uh, Persia, in the Abbasid Caliphate, in Kievan Rus, all these areas, they are now targeted by the Mongols who can now actually break down or at least bust holes in their, their, their cities and their castles. And the Mongols are not a good group to lose to. So they got siege weapons from these uh, Chinese workers and also Persians when they get them too. They're also gonna use them to build roads and infrastructure, well, not, not infrastructure actually, because the Mongols don't leave a whole lot behind. That's one of the things about them. But they conquer everyone, and it's nasty, by the way. They use uh, they use the surrounding people from your city uh, as human shields and and lob their disease-filled bodies into your city to try and contaminate you. Uh, they they are not a, like I said, they are not a good group to uh, to lose to uh, these Mongols or or fight against, for that matter. It's kind of a random question, but. Afghanistan was Turks or Mongols? Now would be more Turks for sure. Mongols aren't anywhere really near Afghanistan. All the most of the Istans are of or predominantly Turkish descent, but there's there's some mix. I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to know all of the different ethnicities of Afghanistan, but uh, they're much closer and have been have been conquered more. That region anyway has been conquered more by by Turkish people. So that's what I would guess. Anywho. They're going to use these people to uh, function their armies, to build siege weapons, to build roads, and all types of things to keep that, that empire going. And it does. It goes quite a while. Uh, it doesn't lose until it gets to uh, parts of Europe and um, the, uh, uh, the Byzantine Empire area. Because they, they knock out the Abbasid Caliphate. They knock out the... Well, they, here's, here's all of their victims here. Victims. These are major kingdoms, by the way, not just like tiny kingdoms that aren't mentionable. They've got China for the Song Dynasty. I'll put Song Dynasty. Persia. Again. Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, Kievan Rus. That's just some of the major, uh, major civilizations that they pretty much wipe out, or at least subjugate. All right. When they take over, and uh, Genghis Khan dies, and his uh, son, Ogade, dies eventually, they split this up. It's too big. So they split up into four parts. You guys remember the four parts? Ilkhanate, Golden Horde, Ilkhanate, Golden Horde Grand Khanate, or Great Khanate? Uh, Chardai. Chardai. Chardai, yeah. So we have the, uh, it's split into four parts. These are all called Khanates. So there's the Ilkhanate, which is the area of like Persia. There's the Golden Horde, which is the area of like, that's more like West Asia, Eastern Europe. We've got the Chagate, Chagate uh, Khanate, which is Central Asia, and then of course the Great or Grand Khanate, which is China. So Khanates are a new form of government. These are run by a Khan. Yep. Who was the Khan of the, uh, the, at least the major one? of the great Khanate of the Yuan Dynasty in China. You guys remember? Kublai Khan, right. So we had the great Khanate, Golden Horde, we had the Chagatay, Chagatay, and the old Khanate. So those are my four Khanates. And of course, the Yuan Dynasty is the uh, Great Khanate, that's in China, and that's run by um, uh, Kublai Khan first. Okay, so what they're going to do when they conquer you is, you guys already know this part at least, they're going to use your people uh, for further war purposes, use people for war, whether it's building siege weapons, fighting, acting as human shields, building roads, whatever. Uh, they're gonna be fueling this, this, this Mongol war machine. <clears throat> and they're also going to demand paid 
tribute from these defeated people. So if I lost them in Persia, I'm going to be paying them every year, two years, or three years, or whatever, um, for them not to come back and stomp me and slap me around some more. So do you think that this Mongolian Empire is going to be very well uh, liked? No. Not at all, right? It's not going to last that long either. Not only is it too big anyway, but uh, everyone's waiting for a chance to break free. Same thing's going to happen with the Aztecs, who we're going to talk about here in a bit, is they're a little too brutal in their ruling. They overtax and they pull too much stuff from people. They have these tributes. They use them for war or for, for blood sacrifices in the case of the Aztecs. So people were just waiting to uh, rebel and break away from this empire. It's not like the Persian Empire where people were better off. They're definitely worse off here under the Mongols. <clears throat> Do the Mongols build any like crazy cool like structures or things like that that last? No. No, they don't. Do they force people to learn their Mongolian language? No. no, they don't. Do they spread a particular religion? No. No, they don't. Do they have like this, you know, dominant written language that they replace everybody else's with? No. No, they don't. So what's going to happen when the Mongols go away in the 1300s? Everything goes back to the way. Yeah, it's almost like they didn't exist. I mean, they did, but it's almost like they didn't exist, at least their, their empire did, because they don't leave any major structures, no major language or cultural um, uh, marks. They allow religious freedom, so people just keep practicing what they practice, building what they build, and speaking the way they speak. So once the Mongolians go away in 150 years, like it's almost like they were never in Persia or anything like that to begin with. If they were so unstoppable, what stopped them at the Byzantine Empire? Um, they lost to the Egyptians, uh, who had some help from some of the Europeans, uh, and they also lost to the Polish and Lithuanian uh, forces over here. But by then they were they were split. It's not like they were dealing with like the one single unified uh, Mongolian army. But I mean like that's kind of how war goes. Like if you've got a big army and you lose one big battle, like it's really hard to keep going after that. It's just you just lost a bunch of momentum and people and things like that. Alright, so there's not gonna be a whole lot of uh, not a big lasting cultural impact. Because again they allowed religious freedom, they didn't change languages, and no architecture. Why didn't they have architecture, by the way? They're too busy killing people. Not just that, but do pastoralists have architecture? No. No, they move around all the time, right? So they're not even going to think about that sort of thing. Okay, one huge benefit that does come from the Mongolian Empire, like most of this is kind of bad, especially if you're conquered by the Mongolians. What is a, quite a good thing, although it ends up being bad, though? What's a good thing that they, a good purpose they do serve here? Don't they like reestablish the Silk Road? Exactly. The They're going to, they plus the affluence, the caliphates, so the caliphates and the Mongolian Empire operating together, um, or simultaneously anyway, that's going to make trade go like through the roof. So the uh, Silk Road's going to come back, Silk Road is back, Indian Ocean Trade Network is hopping, uh, Mediterranean Sea Trade Network is going to be hopping because those two are hopping. So we have a lot of increased world trade here. It increases so much, by the way, that we actually have some new cities that become incredibly powerful, which is what we're going to talk about next. Wait, trade networks after the Silk Road Indian Ocean Trade Mediterranean too. Yeah, and trans saharans also going to be amplified, but that's more by the Abbasid Caliphate. All right. So, any questions about the Mongolian Empire? Who started it? Okay, Who continued after you died? Oh, okay. Uh, what was the dynasty in China when the Mongols took over? Yuan. Yuan. Who ran that? Kublai Khan. Uh, when the Mongolians took over, when they split it up, what did they split it up into? What type of government? Khanates. Khanates. And then these Khanates, what would they do with people they conquered? They would use them for war. Tribute. Collect tributes. Tribute. That's good enough. Um, what lasting impression did they leave on the world? Nothing. Not much, because there's no language, religion, or architecture they built or pushed on people. Well, we know about them. <clears throat> what did they increase dramatically, though? Trade. Trade, especially the Silk Road. Got it. All right. Let's do some. Well, we'll do. Well, actually, we'll do uh, West Africa some crafty them, because we're going to talk about them anyway. So West Africa. So West Africa, other than some limited trade with East Africa, they've been pretty much cut off from the world, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so they've been cut off for the most part. So they're 
a little bit behind technologically and a little bit behind uh, politically, but there's, they still have plenty of things and, and uh, resources to offer the world. So trade with them is going to be a positive thing. So West Africa, one of the first major empires coming out of West Africa is going to be the Empire of Ghana, which is going to be uh, roughly 600 to the 1200 CE region. David Navarez, please report to the front office. David Navarez, please report to the front office. And then the next empire, which is going to be substantially larger, is Mali, which is going to be the 1200 or 1300s, I can't remember exactly, to about the 1600s CE. So those are going to be primarily in this region here, West Africa. By the way, what, what prevents people from trading this way? The yeah, the Sahara is the biggest desert in the world. What's going to allow them to finally connect this way? Because they do. In period three, they do connect across the Sahara Desert here. Yeah, caravans, right? And what animal? Horses? Donkeys? Yeah. Camels, because those are the only things that can actually make that trip. So caravans and camels allow the Arabs and the Bedouins, which are the native people of North Africa, that's going to allow them to uh, trade with the West African empires for the first time. So, I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this. The Arabs are probably the wealthiest group of people, except maybe China, them and, and China, the wealthiest group of people at the time in the 1200s and the 1300s. So who would the West Africans benefit from greatly by trading with? Arabs. Yeah, with the Arabs, and they do, right? The Arabs reach them uh, with their caravans and camels um, for the first time in period three here. So they're able to tra travel and trade uh, with these Arabs. We talked about this before. Why would people convert to Islam just to trade with the Arabs? Trade benefits. Yeah, because they get trade benefits. So some Arabs will only trade with other Muslim people. Some Arabs will give you first choice of goods if you are a Muslim. Some Arabs will give you a discount if you are also Muslim, assuming they're Muslim too. So who's going to be converting here in uh, West Africa, specifically in Mali, the empire that they connect with? Nobles and the kings. Exactly. The leaders and the nobles. So the kings and the nobles. Why not the peasants or, or, or regular people? They're not doing the trade. Yeah, they're not doing the trade, so they don't really care. Do these kings and nobles force people below them to convert to Islam? No. They do not. In fact, that's a huge point here. In West Africa, in West Africa, at least until the Songhai dynasty, uh, Islam and Islamic law are not enforced. So that's going to result in pretty much just kings and, well, I'll say elites. Kings and elites convert or trade, uh, but the uh, regular people are largely not going to convert. Or at least it's not going to, at least the law is not going to be enforced on them. The Islamic law is not going to be enforced on them. Okay, so I've got that going on. I got these kings and elites. There's another thing that these kings and elites can borrow from the Arabs. Now, do West Africans have a whole lot of experience in running these large centralized governments or empires? No, no they don't, right? They've, they've had no connection with the world. And, and yeah, they've made their own, but they don't have a lot of experience. Who does have experience, though? Arabs. Arabs. Who do the Arabs get their experience from? Persian. The Persians, right. So these Arabs also bring a lot of Arabs, bring uh, political knowledge on how to rule slash run an empire. So what, uh, what are two or three things that these Arabs really enjoyed trading for or buying from for these West Africans? Gold. Gold, gold ivory. Salt. Salt. And it's actually Arabs that started officially this West African slave trade. So we have this, um, so we have gold, ivory, copper, salt, and West African slaves. Who else starts buying slaves from West Africans? The Portuguese, exactly, and the Europeans later on in the age of, uh, age of exploration. Uh, but the West Africans had been 
uh, capturing slaves and selling them to each other and the Arabs for centuries before the Europeans ever got there. That does not make it right for the Europeans to do it, um, but it's just something that was going on in West Africa uh, with the West Africans themselves and with the Arabs way before the Europeans ever got there. Still totally wrong, obviously, when the Europeans get there and do it. All right, so that's going to be a big part of West African trade. Uh, we've even got an example of a very famous uh, West African ruler who was Muslim. He went on his hajj and spread so much gold along his trip that it actually caused inflation. Yeah, Mansa Musa. From Mali, and he went on the hajj. Is that two J's or one? Two. Two. Yeah. So he goes on his hajj, and he, he spreads so much gold along his trip that uh, it actually causes like regional inflation in the caliphates. Wait, is he the one that established like the over 100 Quranic schools and stuff like that? That's Timbuktu. We'll talk about that when we do the city-states, specifically. We're winding down time a little bit here, though. Um, I think that's about all I want to say about West Africa for the moment. You know what? We will say Timbuktu, actually. So this is a, this is a powerful city-state. But the Mali government is going to actually incorporate this into its empire, so it's going to be a major city. So Timbuktu is a very famous city in the northern part of this Mali empire. And it's important because it's a, a primary first stop in trade. So a lot of the Arabs come straight to Timbuktu, and a lot of the East Africans as well uh, come straight to Timbuktu. So it gets a lot of, a lot of traffic. So Timbuktu is going to be a very rich trade city part of the Mali Empire. And also it's going to be a big center for Islam. It's going to have about 150-ish uh, Quranic schools, which again, Quran is, the, is, like a, is like the codifying document, or like a Bible, or the Torah uh, for Islam. So if you plus um, Quranic schools for Islam. <clears throat> and Timbuktu is going to be one of those powerful Trade cities. We get a lot of trade cities here in the uh, in period three. Why do we get so many trade cities, by the way? We're gonna we're gonna talk about this in a second. We get trade cities popping up that are very powerful all over the place in period three. Why in period three, not period two? Okay. There's more empires to make trade more prosperous, there's more people to do the trading, there's more areas to occupy for that trade, those trade empires, absolutely. It's a combination of those three. So you have company, or, uh, cities like Novgorod, you've got cities like Timbuktu, you've got cities like uh, Baghdad, you've got cities like uh, Malacca, you've got cities like, uh, what else am I missing, Calicut, the Swahili city-states. What's the uh, Chinese one? It starts with an H. Hongzhou. Hongzhou. Hong, Hongzhou. Yeah, Hongzhou. Hongzhou or Hongzhou. Exactly, however you say it. Correct. Those are the uh, major cities that become very powerful because of all the trade going on. So we'll talk about those probably now, actually. Doesn't Islam contribute to it? Right? Yeah. The thing that's... Oh, speaking of which, what are the... What are some major empires that make that trade so explosive here in this, in this period three? Yeah, the Caliphates. Mongolian Empire, absolutely, and you can say China too. Uh, those are all going to be uh, elements that, that cause a lot of um, growth and expansion of trade. Trade is, obviously trade is very important in the AP world, but it's especially important in this, in this era. In this era, in, in the post-classical era, and the early modern era, that's when trade is probably the most important. Uh, because it really settles in here in the old world and, and digs in, and then when the new world opens up in, in the early modern era, that just really extra amplifies all the trade networks as well. All right, any questions about the Mongols or about West Africa? All right. Let's do uh, city-states. Actually, before I do city-states, I need to talk about a group of raiding explorers that came from Scandinavia that discovered the Americas before everybody else. And yeah, the Vikings, exactly. Yeah, these cool guys. So, at about 700-ish to 1350-ish, I have a thing called the warming period, the, the medieval warming period in Europe. So it gets 
quite warm in Europe and the population increase. So we got ice melting, population increase because there's more uh, there's more harvest harvest time and less food is dying from from being too cold in the winter or whatever. So we got 1350, or sorry, 71350 C. You get a, a warming period. And I just told you, but why does a warming period increase the amount of food? Now you have less food dying, uh, you got more harvest time. You get more harvest time, less food dying, exactly. The population goes up. Yep, and the population is going to rise. So one of the first places to really struggle with this population growth is Scandinavia here. Uh, these are where the uh, Norwegian and, Scandin uh, and Swedish people are. And uh, the ones that go out and explore and raid, those are called Vikings. Um, the reason they think that they do this is because Scandinavia started becoming overpopulated. And it's not, there's not a whole lot of space in Scandinavia. It's mostly like mountains and unlivable terrain. So they believe that quite a few of these people were forced to go out and, you know, conquer or settle or steal from neighboring areas. So this time period from about 700 to 1100 is known as the Viking Age. And it's defined, at least in Europe, by... These Norsemen, these men from the north that come and invade and take their stuff and eventually settle some areas as well. So there's some explorers like Leif Erikson uh, that go and discover Iceland and Greenland and of course what they call the Vinland, which is what we know today as Canada and Newfoundland. So they discover all these areas and settle them. Uh, they're going to settle and raid in, the, uh, uh, in Great Britain here, in the British Isles. They're going to do it in uh, the Baltic Sea here. They're going to do it in France, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, into Spain. They get all the way over, by the way, to what is now like Iraq. Uh, as far as like invading, uh, raiding, and trading with people, they get all over the place. So these Vikings get extremely wealthy. They love taking from Christians, by the way. Why do they like, why do they like trade taking from Christians? Churches. Yeah, because are churches armed and protected? Yeah. No, because because most Christians didn't didn't attack or take from other churches because that was their religion. They thought they would be like struck down by lightning or go to hell or whatever. So those were just unprotected places with lots of gold and jewels and things like that. So the Vikings show up. They're not Christian. They're pagan. They're just like, oh, sweet, free stuff. And they just kill the monks and take it. Um, so they get a, a whole bunch of... Um, uh, uh, loot essentially and things to melt down and sell um, and by the way there's a particular piece of transportation technology they have invented that allows them to travel across the ocean but also so light and shallow they can go up rivers which people are not ready for long boats? yeah long boats that's going to allow this alright so vikings they're going to raid trade explore and settle. Their longboats give them a big advantage on, on the sea. They can go long distances. They can also go up rivers, which most people cannot do because they're made with those flat bottoms, uh, wide flat bottoms that allow them to go far up these river, river channels, uh, past the coastal defenses and towns. And they wreak havoc in the, the British Isles, Northern Europe, the Mediterranean, Scandinavia. They explore over here into Greenland, Iceland. They could get all over the place. So who are they going to do most of their trading with uh, to sell this stuff to? And, 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 Novgorod. Yeah. Wait, say that again? Novgorod, was it? Yeah, well, Novgorod, correct, is going to be the main city-state that gets a lot of their, their loot. Uh, and they're going to trade that down. So the Vikings are going to really amplify the trade and wealth of the city of Novgorod, which is very close to them. They're also going to use the Kievan Rus to trade with the Byzantine Empire, who hires them, by the way, to fight the Arabs and things like that, or the Turks, rather. Um, in the, uh, uh, after the Turkish invasion here in Anatolia. They're going to trade with the Caliphates. They're going to trade with all of these areas and greatly enrich them. Specifically, though, like I mentioned, that, that city-state of Novgorod, which is going to become a, a powerful political entity and, and sort of expand and start its own um, Novgorod Republic in period four, which we'll talk about when we talk about the start of Russia as a state. So the Vikings actually do leave a pretty big mark on the world uh, with their longboats and amplifying trade. And, of course, they're going to increase the wealth of Novgorod. All right. What's my city-state over here in Mali that uh, connects to the Abbasid Caliphate in East Africa? Timbuktu. What's my capital of the Abbasid Caliphate here in what is now Iraq that becomes extremely wealthy with the Abbasid Caliphate? Yeah. Baghdad. What about my city in India that becomes very powerful from trade? Calcutta. Calcutta. 
What about these series of cities, independent cities in East Africa? Small city cities. Remember, that's a mix of Arab culture and language and Bantu color, culture and language. What trade route opens these up, by the way, to the Indians? Indian Ocean. I, I meant to say, what, what wind pattern? Oh, oh monsoon oh, winds. You guys were right, though. That's what I asked. So, good, good, good job. Um, over here in Indonesia, I have a, a trade city state. Malaka. I have two, actually. No, I got the one. Malacca. Malacca. Was Jakarta one of them? No, that was that was in the Dutch to go. Yeah. So Malacca. I've got Hong Sao over here in uh, China. I feel like we're missing one. Venice. That's what we're missing. Where's Venice at? Yeah. Italy. Middle Italy. Yeah. Middlemen. Yep, the middlemen of Europe. Cool. So we've got Hong Sao, Novgorod, Calicut, Malacca. Swahili. We've got Timbuktu. Hello. Pizza delivery Sweet. Here. We do. So can you uh, pause that for us there? Really? Okay. So I have some city states. I know we went depth on a few of these. So we had Wang Sao. Uh, we have Calicut. Baghdad, no Karad, we did talk about it, we didn't, we didn't really go too much in depth on them. They're all enriched by trade in this era, but the ones we did talk about specifically in AP World were <clears throat> Malacca, we talked about Timbuktu, which we already discussed today actually, we talked about Venice, and Swahili city states. Okay, what made Malacca so uh, so rich, by the way? Yeah, it's the gateway to the Pacific. So this little this little strait here that goes through uh, um, what is now like you know Southeast Asia slash Indonesia. Uh, this is called the Straits of Malacca, and like they're called that because that that city state established itself on that strait. So it would. <laughs> It would toll people, or people would stop and trade with them uh, on their way through to uh, visit uh, China, essentially, and trade with China. Same with the Chinese going out to the Indian Ocean. So they got a lot of traffic, and you get a lot of traffic, or you stop them to, uh, to collect a toll or have a tax, a tribute tax, that's going to make you wealthy. <clears throat> and the name of the empire that had this was like the Shriyavaya Empire, something like that. Something close to that, that I can never remember, because it's a lot of letters that I'm not good at remembering. But yeah, the Shriyavaya Empire, and uh, they, they had Malacca, and that city's gonna be quite wealthy. Just all the boats going by, and they're able to tax and toll some of them as well. A lot of pirates over here later on, too. Okay, so they are wealthy because of why I just told you? Right, because why did everyone have to go buy them, though? <laughs> yep, straight to Malacca, get with the Pacific. Book two we talked about, it's rich because it's in Mali, it's that first stop for most of the Arab traders in the caliphates and most of the traders coming from the east, or from East Africa as well, and they have a lot of Quranic schools there, it's part of Mali, like I said. Venice, how do they, these guys get so rich over here in Italy? The what do you mean they're the middlemen of Europe? Uh, they're the ones bringing in uh, Abbasid Caliphate goods to the Exactly. So all the goods that are coming in from China, India, and Ocean Trade Network, all these places, they come to the Caliphates, and then the Caliphates are going to trade to somebody to distribute to Europe, the rest of Europe. That somebody's going to be Venice. So Venice is going to do a lot of trading with these Caliphates, and then they're going to spread their goods into Europe. So they are that middleman between the Europeans and the Caliphates slash the rest of the world. So they're going to make, become quite wealthy off of that. The middlemen. Of Europe. <clears throat> and what do they learn how to do and control and get a large quantity of that makes them very powerful? You guys know? Boats. Yeah, Navy, right, boats, Navy. Because like what what is this this sea called here again? Mediterranean. Mediterranean. They're gonna they're gonna essentially control 
at least a large portion of this Mediterranean Sea, and that's going to keep them in power for quite a while, uh, and it's going to uh, protect and enrich their trade. All right, so they're going to be uh, master sailors, and they're going to have a large navy. Because, by the way, when we go Age of Exploration, and Portugal and Spain are funding explorers, what kind of sailors do they hire? Yeah, Italian sailors, right? A lot of them from Venice, too. Okay. Swahili city-states. What trade networks are these Swahili city-states connected to that make them rich? Trans-Saharan trade network, absolutely. And what else? Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean, right? They're right. The, the monsoon would just really dump you off on that coast. All right, cool. Our Indian Ocean trade network. <clears throat> so they get a ton of traffic going from West Africa and from the uh, Indian Ocean as well. So. They have a lot of copper, gold, and ivory that they're able to offer, and people are going to buy that. And what, what, what's the dominant religion there? Muslim. Islam. Islam. Why is, it, why is Islam the dominant religion there? They're not, they're not Arab or Turkic. What brought Islam there? Um, the, uh, the, Ar uh, what was it, the Arab uh, di diaspora, or no? Muslim diaspora, yeah. That's where all the Muslim merchants spread all of the Indian Ocean. They built mosques, and they converted people based on those trade benefits. So the Swahili city stage is one of those, and that is going to be a mix of Arab and Bantu language and culture. They're going to be Islamic, thanks to the Muslim diaspora. And they're going to have a lot of gold, ivory, copper to offer people. Do they unify into an empire? No. No, they stay independent. Cities, states. <clears throat> what made Novgorod, Novgorod rich? Viking. Viking trade. What made Baghdad rich? Yeah, it's the center of all the trade uh, of the uh, Abbasid Caliphate, absolutely. And uh, Caliphate just got richer because there's increased uh, trade in the initial trade networks, same with Hang Tsao. Speaking of trade, there's a lot of travelers going about for the first time, able to like see the world for the most part along these uh, trade routes. There's one from India, no, sorry, not India. There's one from uh, uh, North Africa. There's one from Europe, and there's one from China. Marco Polo. Marco Polo was from Europe. Yep, Europe. Marco. Well, I think he was Venetian actually. We all have explorers besides the Vikings. I should say travelers, actually. They're not really exploring. Travelers is a better way to describe it. All right, so these travelers, you can just thank you. Who else I got? You live in eighth grade. No, not Columbus. That's 1492, come on now. The guy who wrote Journey to the West. The guy who wrote Journey to the West? Yeah. Mm, no, that was the Chinese guy's name. Uh, his name I forgot. I can't remember his name. Is even Batuta? Even Batuta is correct. You learned it in 7th grade as well, or 8th grade as well. So you learned it twice. You got no excuse. Alright, even Batuta. He is the uh, guy from North Africa. Um, I don't know Morocco or what, but he's an Arabic uh, or an Islamic Muslim uh, from North Africa, and he's going to trade, he's going to travel all of Dar al-Islam. So he's going to see most of the world, and he's never going to really step outside of Islam, because they're just all over the place at this point. Like I said, North Africa, Middle East, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, East Africa, West Africa. He goes to all of them, and he never has to step outside of the Muslim world to do that. All right. <clears throat> Dar al Islam. We also had a very famous traveler. Remember the Ming Dynasty? Remember after the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongols took over? They had the uh, Red Turban Rebellion, the Turban Rebellion, and they kick out the Mongols, and the Ming Dynasty takes over. And to show how powerful and amazing they are, they send their giant uh, fleet and navy on like a world tour, kind of, uh, to sort of show Chinese wealth and power and also to collect a whole bunch of exotic goods and animals to bring back to China. Remember who that was? Admiral Tseng Ha. Yep, Tseng Ha, correct. Admiral Tseng Ha. So that's what they're doing, basically. So he's a uh, navy, naval, well, admiral, to show 
Chinese strength and power, and also to collect exotic things and animals. So even Batuta, Marco Polo, these travelers, they, they, they catalog their travels. And um, <clears throat> they're amazed by a lot of things, especially China, especially Marco Polo by China. Right, so how it points out and sees like how wonderful the architecture is and the people and how orderly and, and clean and amazing it is. So they're very impressed with some of these, you know, visual discoveries and, and, and monuments and things like that. But what is the dominant attitude these guys both have when, when seeing the cultures of other people? Um, yeah, they see them as barbaric or inferior, absolutely. So they, they definitely respect some parts of their culture. But they're also going to kind of look down condescendingly on a lot of these uh, uh, civilizations. And that's going to be the dominant. That's going to be the dominant tone uh, for these explorers. It's going to be they're going to essentially sort of look down on um, other cultures. So a little a little close-minded. So close-minded, but appreciate some aspects. Like for one, even Batuta goes uh, is a little bit experiences a little culture shock when he goes to West Africa and sees how scantily clad everybody is and how loosely they uh, view companionship. Uh, he, he's a little bit perplexed by that, a little bit shocked by it. Uh, same with Marco Polo. He doesn't like the fact that some dog or some uh, uh, animals that are seen as like unclean by Christians are being eaten by uh, Asians and things like that. So that's normal in Asia, but in, in Europe it's looked down upon. So they're, they're a little closed-minded when it comes to these sorts of things even though they appreciate some other things. Any questions about the travelers? No, they were uh, amazed by some parts of culture, but they also looked down on some as inferior or barbaric. All right, that's kind of the tone here. If you ever have to read a document about them or whatever, they may test. us. Got it? All right. You're all like, I just want to go home. So do I. Okay. So those are the travelers and the city states. Let's uh, so we did the city states. We did Islam, Guatemala, Delhi, Sultanate, Islam, China. We haven't done feudalism yet, so we'll do feudalism, and that's gonna be a bunch of like random things. So feudalism. You know what? No. Yes, feudalism. Where do I have feudalism? In Europe and Japan. Japan. Yes. Did they tell each other about their cool systems and they copied them? No. No, they just developed in different parts of the world at roughly the same time. So why does the feudal system exist in... No, let me backtrack that. These are the Middle Ages in Europe. Why do we call them the Middle Ages in Europe? What, what are they in the middle of? The fall of Rome and, and the Renaissance. Exactly right. So that's this, this middle period here. So we're looking at uh, Rome and then the Renaissance. And this area here is the uh, Middle Ages. So, the Middle Ages. Is there a large centralized empire that unifies all or most of Europe? No. no. Right? Central governments are pretty either weak or non-existent. We have a couple that try. What are the dangers of when the Roman Empire in the West ends in 485? What are they, what are they vulnerable to? Attacks from the Germans. Okay, invasion from other tribes. What, who else could be an invader that's coming in? Um, like Arabs and Mongols. Okay, Arabs and Mongols. Okay, later in the 1300s, that's true, on the very edges, yeah. Huns, though, don't forget the Huns. Like, Hungary, that, that whole area, like, the Huns were a real thing. They settled there, too. So, potential dangers. We've got each other, of course. We've got Germanic tribes coming in. Fleeing from the Huns. And also Gothic tribes coming in. All of these, all of these invaders, these are all invaders. So they need a system of protection. Can Rome protect them? No. no. Is there a strong central government somewhere that can protect them? No, for the most part. So what do they need? What kind of a system? Local, local system is what they need. Right. So they develop the feudal system. So the feudal system has a thing called vassals. What are vassals? You have the people in the class below you, right. So you've got a king, and below the king is the nobles and the lords, and below that is the 
knights, the, the like the warrior class, and then below that, the peasants, right. So this is my, my, my uh, feudal system hierarchy. I king, nobles, knights, and peasants. So uh, again, below, the classes below you are called what? Vassals. Vassals. So is a noble a vassal of a knight? No. no. Is a knight a vassal of a noble? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what's keeping these guys loyal, by the way? Because they just have to listen. Fealty. Fealty. What's fealty? It's a pledge of loyalty. So uh, the uh, peasants and knights say that they're going to obey the nobles as long as the nobles do what? Protect them. Yeah, protect them and provide for them. So if there's an invader or a famine, they provide protection through force or uh, protection through food, right? So, fealty, sworn oath of obedience or loyal, of loyalty in exchange for protection. So you have the right to kick your lord or your king out, I guess, if they're not, like, you know, providing for you and those sorts of things. And that happens a lot of the time. They're called peasant rebellions. There's a few of them. What are some of the problems that people dislike about this feudal system? Because it kind of works for defending themselves from Vikings, which are another invader I forgot to mention, by the way. Vikings. Oh, you can't move up. Yeah, there's almost zero social mobility. So if I'm born a peasant, what am I going to be for the rest of my life? A peasant. What if I'm super smart and work really hard and all that stuff? Doesn't matter. I'm, I'm stuck to my piece of land and serving my lord or my knight or whatever or my king uh, until the day I die with no opportunity to go up for the most part. What is it? Is it? Uh, are these like the times where, like, if you do something uh, really great, like, like saving the king or something? Like they, they yeah, exactly. Like, if you're a noble or a knight or even a peasant that does something, does something really courageous, there's a very rare opportunity to be knighted or uh, made to a lord, given a lordship or whatever. That super rare though, like one in a million or or or, or lower maybe, right? So it's it's very very low chance that that's going to happen for you. You're just likely going to be born and live and die on that exact same square bit of land and in that same town uh, that, that you grew up in with no chance of moving elsewhere. Okay, so that's a little depressing. So um, because because of some of this, oh and by the way, who is there going to be a little bit of social disparity between the classes as far as how much they have? Yes. Absolutely, right? Peasants have almost nothing. Uh, knights and, and nobles have a lot and the kings have a lot as well. So um, there are going to be some peasant revolts, right? You ever heard of a couple peasant revolts? Yeah, there's going to be a couple. Uh, one of them that's going to pop up in resistance to this feudal system because of being overtaxed and mistreated and not actually being taken care of is in the 1300s I'm going to have the English Peasant Rebellion. Not to be confused with the Cyril, or sorry, uh, uh, Basil of Copperhand, which is the uh, resistance to the Corvée labor in the Byzantine Empire. Or to be confused with Ketz Rebellion, which is a rebellion also in England in the 1500s uh, in a resistance to the um, uh, end of common land and the enclosure movement. Also not to be confused with the German Peasant Rebellion, which is about scripture. Yay. So don't, don't confuse those four or five Peasant Rebellions that all sound very similar. Do your best to anyway. <clears throat> so English Peasant Rebellion, and that's going to be against feudal system. Are there some attempts, though, in Europe to actually form a centralized government? Yes. I got two. Yeah, I got two. So I got really early on, like the 700s, 800s uh, uh, CE, I have a French king. Charlemagne. Charlemagne is correct. He's going to conquer most of what's today France and a lot of what is Germany and northern Italy. And in fact, the Pope is so excited he does this, he's like, oh my gosh, it's the, Ro it's the Roman Empire, Empire 2.0. I'm going to anoint you the king of this Holy Roman Empire, and in fact, they try and call it. So in the 8s and 900s, we have the start of this thing called the Holy Roman Empire. And what, what area is this mostly, by the way? France. Oh, it's got a lot of France in it, but mostly it's German and, and some Italian, too. So they call it the Holy Roman Empire. And how do they choose their emperor? By conquest? Who, who earned it the most? How do they choose it? They vote for it, right? So this is going to be something that people are always going to respect and listen to? No, that's an emperor that sometimes they will listen to, these princes and kings that are in this area here. 
in Germany, northern Italy, parts of France. So sometimes they will listen and sometimes they will not listen, right? Because they haven't been forced to listen. They're just agreeing to listen to a certain leader. But I mean, it's kind of like the whole Trump, Obama, Bush thing. Like if you didn't vote for him and he wins, do you want to support him? No, and uh, that's going to be a very similar case here in the Holy Roman Empire. Right, so we're going to have uh, uh, a, an elected emperor. However, it's going to be a weak and disunited empire. Which ironically lasts like a thousand years, somehow. But it, it's never going to be very powerful. Okay. <clears throat> Two countries, though, do start popping up and start developing somewhat of an identity at around the 900s, because this country, in fact, breaks away from the Holy Roman Empire after Charlemagne dies and his sons die. Uh, France and England are going to start to form an identity based on common language and common culture. So that happens in the 900s. It's not like they have this centralized government that's awesome yet, but this is where they start to start seeing people as like French or English and identifying based on that. By the way, this empire started by Charlemagne from France. You guys remember what it was called? Carolingian, Carolingian Empire, yep. Okay. Let's go economically. In the Middle Ages, what's the dominant um, economic practice here in, uh, in Europe? Nope, not mercantilism. That's not going to be until uh, after exploration. Good guess, though. The guild system? Yeah, the guild system, which is a part of mercantilism, but guilds start a lot earlier. What do guilds control, by the way? These are, these are by the way, groups of rich merchants and townspeople. Yeah, they're going to control production, so they decide how much is made. What else? Quantity. Price. Yeah, quantity, <clears throat> price. Quality. They also check for the quality. Who does the hiring? They do. They hire uh, and choose apprenticeships, etc. They tell you to make. Yep, and what to make. Okay. Does this allow for a lot of creativity? No. No, this is going to really, really cripple creativity. They're trying to keep it like as effective as possible and check the quality and all that, but really what happens is they just limit people and they make it a lot less creative. What, by the way, is going to come along later in a few hundred years and make things a lot more open and free and creative for people? Not mercantilism. Capitalism. capitalism, right. Or at least the fundamentals of capitalism. Okay, guilds and... Man, I wanted to say one other thing, but I forgot. Maybe that was it. Yeah, that's good for now. I was going to get that. I was going to do that when we talk about uh, all the economic uh, innovations they have. So we good on feudal Europe for right now? Yes. Okay. So, where else did I have feudalism? Japan. Yeah. Japan. So Japan, at roughly seven, a little bit before that, in the late 600s, we'll just say 700 CE, Japan is a very powerful neighbor that admires across the, uh, across the sea. China. China, yeah. They really like the culture and the state system that China has. So the, uh, so the, the emperor and kings in uh, Japan decide, hey, we should copy what they do. Is this something Japan does a couple times in its history? Yeah, it does. It does it pretty well, too. Um, so what they do is they send a bunch of government officials and scholars to China, and they write down everything they can about how the Chinese culture works, uh, Confucianism, Buddhism, how their written language works, uh, how their art is, how their government functions. They take it all back to Japan. What was that called? Taika reforms. Taika reforms, yeah. And again, that's where scholars... And officials copied Chinese culture and uh, government, political system. So what are some cultural things they copy? They bring over. Their language. Their language, okay, written language. Those symbols. They also bring over... Oh yeah, Buddhism, I'll do that last, but yes, they bring over Confucianism. Not completely, though, but only partially. They also bring over Buddhism. Architecture. 
And yeah, their architecture as well. I'll throw them there too. Architecture and art. We'll just say architecture and art. Because they do. Japanese art is very similar to Chinese art, especially back then. Okay. And uh, what... They don't take all of Confucianism. They just take some of the core fundamentals of Confucianism, like the ancestral veneration portions, which apply to them. But they already had a dominant religion over there in Japan that mixes with Buddhism. It's going to take a, it's going to take a much more spiritual approach uh, to Buddhism, mixing in their belief of kamis and spirits and things like that. Yeah, Shintoism, so that's going to merge with Buddhism to be Shinto Buddhism. So, what do we call it when we blend our local and our yeah, syncretizes uh, Buddhism into Shinto Buddhism? I think that's a much more spiritual um, version of Buddhism. Okay, do these things all work? Do they stay? Do they stick? They do. Yeah, for the most part they do. The ones that don't stick very well are going to be the reforms to the government. Now, is Japan used to having a centralized uniform government? No. no China's had one for, I mean, at this point, how many? I mean, over a thousand years already. Japan's just been a bunch of local kingdoms and rulers fighting over each other. So are they gonna, are they gonna unify instantly and be like, yeah, great idea, and just unify? No. no, it's gonna take, who's gonna do that eventually, by the way? Yeah, the Tokugawa Shogunate's gonna do that by force. So nobody does it by force here, so do you think their attempts to form like a central government, or their attempts to form an imperial city in Kyoto, do you think those are gonna stick and work? No. What's it going to break down into? The feudal system, right. So this fails because they have no history of this whatsoever and is reduced to the feudal system. They have a very similar hierarchy to the Europeans, but we have some different names for these, uh, for these ranks here in the hierarchy. Who is the head, the military leader that's at the top of this hierarchy in Japan? The shogun. The shogun, yeah. What's the equivalent of that in Europe? King. King, King yep. What are their, like, uh, financial support and elites that also provide troops? The nobles that are below that. Daimyo. Daimyo, yep. Those are, like, the nobles in Europe? Who's, like, the knights in Europe? Samurai. Samurai. Those are professional soldiers that people hire. Samurai. All right. Those become especially prominent in the uh, uh, Edo period, the Tokugawa Shogunate era, because they're so it's so peaceful that like they have nothing to do. So they're like hired swords, hired bodyguards, and protectors. Okay. And then um, at the bottom, do we have peasants in Japan? No. No, we don't. Who's the bottom? Merchants. merchants. So we do have peasants here, obviously, but below peasants even are merchants. Because they, like China, see the peasants as the backbone of society, the army, the building, the work, etc., and merchants as making money off of other people's labor. This stuff ring a bell somewhat? Mm -hmm. Alright, good. Relearning is always much easier and quicker than learning, which is why I can do half of period three in an hour and 15 minutes. It took us like three and a half weeks to learn this stuff, by the way, just in case you're wondering. All right. You guys got that? Japan and uh, Europe down? All right. All right, let's do some, uh, let's do some economic innovations. We'll talk a little about disease and trade, a little bit about religion, technology and agriculture, and I, I think we're rounding it up at that point. Do the Mongols, we still talk about the Black Death. Oh, we skip the Americas. I'll do that after I do economic stuff. Those pesky Americas. So we still gotta talk about Sikhism. We gotta talk about the economic innovations, the Americas, religion and society, technology and agriculture and women. When are we done? Those are all quicker topics though, which is nice. So, um, economic innovations. I've got increased trade, right? We've, we've established that at this point. So I've got some new techniques that make it quicker and easier to move more stuff, safer, lighter, and faster. I'm talking like 
I mean, I need money here. So, economic innovation. In the uh, post-classical era. So what are some new ways that I've developed to uh, trade efficiently? Like, you know, trade quicker, lighter, safer, etc. Okay, I'm not talking about transportation mechanisms yet, but you're right, camels are definitely something that's gonna allow me to trade better. So camels, as far as like animals and technology, yes, camels and caravans definitely work. But I'm talking like physical, like money trading here. Oh, yep, checks. And those are going to be invented by the Abbasid Caliphate. They were called like socks, I think. Socks. Yeah, S A K K S. I'm not sure how you pronounce that in Arabic. So we got a check is just essentially like um, saying like here's some of the money I have in my bank account, pretty much like whatever the amount is, and they would go and exchange that and get the money or the gold, the silver, or whatever that was at the bank. So what else is being invented here or established that's going to make it easier and safer? Uh, paper money. Paper money. Why is paper money safer and easier? Oh yeah, much lighter, right, than carrying the actual gold or silver. You can hide it better, it's easier. Uh, as long as your government is stable and it's making its own, it works. And who invents this, by the way? China. Chinese, the Tong Dynasty. Okay. What else I got? Banks. What? Banks. Yeah, banks themselves, right. Banks are now far more established. They can hold your stuff and your money. Uh, they can uh, issue those checks and things like that to make it the trade much quicker and much better. And, and who's really, not that they invented banks, but they're really the ones that take off with these banks as far as Venice, yeah. And now I got places like set to store my money and things like that. Yeah, credit and debit. So as long as I trust the people I'm doing business with, I can uh, sort of run a tab saying like, oh, like, you know, I'm, I want to... I want to trade these things over to these people. Maybe I don't have the money with me, but next time I come back, I'll owe you, you know, 80 pounds of gold or whatever it is. And that's a lot of gold. Eight, eight ounces of gold. That sounds a little more realistic. I'll owe you eight ounces of gold. And if you trust them or whatever, you're doing business with them on a routine, routine basis, you can establish that with the merchant. Like, okay, it's like an IOU kind of running credit and debit tab sort of thing. All right. So it's like an IOU with trusted patron. Or, or a partner. What's another way that people are able to sort of run like a credit and debit system? Loans. Uh, loans. We're gonna call those uh, bills of exchange. Bills of exchange. Now these are just like IOU notes, essentially. Agreeing you will pay somebody by a certain amount of time. So it's similar to the credit and debit. That's what a bill of exchange is. It's like I don't have the money now, but I'd like to buy these from you, go sell them somewhere else, come back and pay you. And you would, you, would, you would pay or show you're going to pay them back with this bill of exchange. And hopefully for that person you actually do, you actually come back or you don't like die on the trip or whatever. And lastly, we already had this, but it's worth mentioning, uh, minted coins. That makes gold much easier to distribute and carry around um, and distribute evenly. And that's gonna enhance and help trade. Can you stop looking at it? All right. Um, we also have in Europe the first time, in Northern Europe, at the very end of the post-classical era, we have some guilds and towns work together to form like these super industries where they give all their business to other specific towns and industries, making themselves super rich and in fact enabling them to have their own navies and soldiers to take from others and protect their own trade routes. What was that trade organization started in Northern Europe? Do you guys remember? Hanseatically, yes. Hanseatic League. I think it was in 1368. That's in Northern Europe. And this consists, of course, of towns and guilds that arrange exclusive contracts to enhance business and profits. And what do they use these profits, these profits to do? What do they give themselves? Armies and navies to right, either take from others or protect their own. Own <laughs> private ships. I'm getting lazier. I can't even read how it's not there. What's that? So it says Hanseatically. Northern Europe. Exclusive carnival. Yeah. Guilds and towns that arrange exclusive contracts. <laughs> 
contracts to enhance profits. <laughs> hey, you do this for 11 hours and see how you feel. Good idea. You could just do what Elvis Stephanie Gorge does. <laughs> I could sit here and put up with the screen like, this is this, this is this, this is this. this, is this. Good luck on the AP exam. <laughs> Slash what? What? Guild slash. Guild slash towns that arrange exclusive contracts to, to enhance profits. Everyone's like done, and you're like on like the top line still. Private ships? Private. Ships. I say private. Oh, own private ships and soldiers. Pirate ships. We're almost to pirates. That's mercantilism. Well, there's still pirates back then, actually. In fact, there was a female Chinese pirate that, like, she was so famous, the Chinese had to, like, forgive her for all of her sins, basically, and just let her have a bunch of territory. I can't remember what her name was, but she's pretty famous. We good on that? We got our, we got our Hanseatic League down. It's also known as Hansa. Alright. Wait, 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 wait. What did they use the pirate ships for? They used their own ships and mercenaries to... Uh, control trade, keep theirs safe, but also to bully and take from others. Because that always happens. That's just humans. It's humans, yo. We're going to oppress each other a little. Okay. That's Mongols. That's trade. That's the city-states. So, with all this trade going at, like, max speed with the Mongols and the Caliphates and these uh, 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 new technologies, by the way, before I touch on that, some new trade technologies. We got a couple already. We've got longboats. We've got uh, a new type of ship that is able to carry more cargo quicker. It's called a yunk. Yeah, looks like junk, but yeah, it's a yunk. Bigger boats. Uh, we also have camels and caravans for deserts. We also have like these sort of inns slash hotels slash pit stops along many of these trade routes on land. You guys remember what those are called? Starts with caravan. Ends with Sari, yeah. Caravan Sari. So these are like inns uh, uh, and stops for long land trade routes. You gotta have a place to stop. And they're roughly all a day's travel apart normally. There's there's obviously some variance, but I mean it's like the missions in California on the uh, in the California coast, well our coast. Uh, they're roughly a a day a day's travel by horse apart. So these caravan series are like, you know, a day or a half day apart. So you can stop them and keep going. So caravan seri, camels caravans that allow you to go over distances on land much quicker, or, or sorry, much more effectively, and in hotter terrain. We also have horse saddles. That was the last period, never mind. Astrolabe. Astrolabe and compass. No, that's period, period four. Astrolabe and compass are going to be invented by the uh, uh, Arabs and the Chinese, respectively. So the uh, Arabs, yeah, that lines up, A and A, C and C. So astrolabe by the Arabs and the uh, compass by the Chinese. So the astrolabe allows you to figure out your um, latitude, how far north you are. So you'll know if you're, uh, if you're you know, way up here or way down here on the earth with the astrolabe. It, it measures basically the stars to see about how far uh, north and south you are. That's the astrolabe is for. That's helpful, so you know if you're nowhere near Britain or whatever you're going towards. And what's the, how does the compass help you out? Yeah, it helps you in a straight line. That's extremely hard to do, uh, well, at all, but especially in the ocean because you get tossed around by the waves and the wind and things like that. On land, too, though, like, if, you, if you're like, I'm going to walk in a straight line, like, you actually, one foot actually walks a little further than the other. So if you let yourself go, you're actually going to go in a big circle eventually, if you don't realize, or at least you're going to go off course. So the compass helps you uh, go straight um, when you need to. So that's going to help uh, profoundly 
with travel and trade and making those a lot more effective. Speaking of travel and trade, all these routes are going at like max capacity at the time. We've got uh, camels, caravans, caravanissary, astrolabes, yokes, compasses. Everyone's all over the place trading with everybody. Much safer and quicker than ever before. That's all great. That's fantastic. You're going to have a lot of production increase. Like you have a lot of textiles in India. You're going to have a lot of steel production in China and other luxury goods. So that's all going to be super, super, super uh, high. However, with all of this spreading of technology and goods and language and culture, I'm also going to have something else spread that's not so good. Disease. disease. What's the major disease that's going to spread from China to the West to Australia? The Black Death. The Black Death, yes. So that's the same, they believe the same virus, that bubonic plague virus, that was, uh, or uh, bacteria, that was around for the plague of Justinian. It's going to start in China. It's going to wipe out 50 to 90% of people in China, the areas it pops up. And it's going to spread via the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean Trade Network to Europe and then to Africa. And it's going to, like I said, have about a 50 to 90% death rate. So the Black Death of the 1300s spreads via Silk Road, Mediterranean Sea Trade Network, and of course the Indian Ocean Trade Network, a little bit as well. And the death rate for this are 50 to 90% in the areas it affects. What areas get hit the hardest, country or city? City. City, because why city? More compact and less sanitary. So urban environments do a lot worse. So it's going to uh, hit urban cities harder. Yep, this is Yesenia Petrus. I was going to blast yesterday after I forgot the name of it the first time. But yeah, the same Petrus or Petrus is the uh, name of the bacteria. All right, so this black death is going to have an impact on, um, well, especially European minds, because we have a lot of writing and art going on in Europe at the time. Uh, this is when the Renaissance is starting up. So it really, boom, punches people in the face. So, um, what, uh, there's some negative and some positive effects on Europe. So, some negative effects. It's going to cause a labor shortage, because a lot of people are dying, it's kind of hard to have enough workers. It's going to have a labor shortage, right? It's going to wipe out city life, or, or harm a lot of cities. It's going to give an apocalyptic tone to people's art, literature, and mindset. Like, they think the world's ending for the most part. Tone to literature and art. Can't even blame it really when, when people are dying like this. But it has some positives. Positives. City life. Not city life. Well, what about city life? It definitely decreases. Some positives, though. Uh, it's going to uh, offer employment opportunity for women, improve wages. Uh, increase wages as well. Wages always increase when the uh, population goes down. Because the same amount of money exists, there's just less people for it to go around between. That usually increases wages because there's a labor shortage. So they're willing to pay you more. Yeah, just leave it. It's annoying. So, um... Also, when, the, uh, when this disease and disunity breaks up the Mongolian Empire, what happens to Silk Road? Gone. Gone. So Europeans, they can't trade directly with China anymore. But that's okay, they can trade through the caliphates, right? Mm -hmm. They're gone. They can't? Okay, you're right. Actually, I, I phrased that incorrectly. The caliphates are gone. But are the Arabs and Turkic uh, people gone? The Muslim people gone? Mm -hmm. No, they're still there. So they can trade with them, right? No. No? Why not? Why don't they like each other? Okay, they have religious differences, but there's, there's a specific series of events that happens in the thousands. Yeah, the Crusades. Right, so that's where the Europeans try to, well, they do for a couple hundred years, take, take back the Holy Land, right? Uh, Jerusalem and the area around it. So that's going to put a serious damper on 
the relations between Christian Europe and the Muslim people of North Africa and the Middle East. So you think they're going to allow them to trade for the Indian spices and Chinese you know, luxury items that they have? No. no. Why can't they use the Silk Road again? It's, it's gone. gone. It's gone. The Mongols are no longer operating. So this is also going to cause, cause Europe to seek a new route to the Indian Ocean Trade Network and China. Do they find one? Yes. Not in this era, but do they find one? Yes. Yeah, they do. And that really actually heavily changes the world and, and, and brings Europe from a zero to a hero, to quote Hercules on uh, the movie. And that is uh, going to bring them from like the absolute bottom in the Middle Ages, uh, bring them all the way back up to the top, economically and militaristically. Okay, that's at least a positive for Europe. Negative for the Native Americans, though, with the uh, disease and whatnot. Okay. So we got that. What else we got? That's the Black Death. So we still got to talk about the Americas, religion, and a little bit on tech, and that's it. And Sikhism. Boy. Okay. Oh, we got plenty of time now. We're good. Come on, that steam, guys. Speaking of Americas, what kind of civilizations am I in frame here? Yeah. All right. Americas. We've got some actually pretty impressive, like, classical era uh, uh, worthy empires here going on in the Americas. Uh, what are my two main empires going on here in the Americas towards the end of the post classical era? Aztec and Incan. Yep. And those are, that's in Mesoamerica over here. That's like the 1300s till basically the Spanish show up. And the Incans, same thing. Roughly the 1300s till the Spanish show up. Okay, the Aztecs come in the 1300s to Mesoamerica. They come from like roughly what is Texas-ish area and they invade downward. Now they're heavily influenced by uh, Teotihuacan and the uh, Chauvin uh, civilizations there, and the Mayans that were there before them, uh, but they do have a particular way with the military that just makes them able to conquer all of the uh, natives that are in Mesoamerica already. So they are a conquest-based empire. So they borrow from uh, Mesoamerican culture. And again, like Tenochtitlan, uh, the Mayans, uh, the Chauvin people, or not the Chauvin people, sorry, Olmec people. I said, I said that earlier in an accident, the Olmec people. They're gonna borrow from them culturally, but they're gonna subjugate them politically. So when they take over, they are not nice. They set you up as a tribute state, so you've gotta pay taxes to them, and also people. So taxes and people. And what are they using these people for? Sacrifices. Yeah, a lot of them are being used for blood sacrifices and blood rituals, right? So, blood sacrifice. If they do keep those ball sports, by the way, that were started by the people of Olmec. They, they really pick up on that. But yeah, they also pick up on the blood sacrifice thing, the step pyramid. So, that's one that makes... When you're conquering people and forcing them to pay tribute and sacrificing their people, like, you know, their blood, like, to death, that is a good way to make them not like you. So what's going to happen when the Spanish show up in a few hundred years and say, hey, you guys want to rebel against the Aztecs? What are they going to say? Yes. 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 Uh, so that's going to make it very easy for disease and other Native Americans to end this empire when the Spanish show up. All right, that's, that's the essentials here for the uh, Aztecs. If you want to know a couple uh, good facts about them, uh, Tenochtitlan is going to be their capital. That is an island city. And uh, how do they feed this island city, by the way? What, what's the uh, agricultural technique they use to uh, do that? Floating islands. Well, islands aren't floating. floating. But you're right, they call them floating gardens, even though they're actually islands. Chinampas. Chinampas. Those are those little island farms that they essentially like live off of. And also you got a couple famous leaders like uh, Montezuma. Specifically the second, he was the last one, the one that died from uh, the, the Spanish invading. Oh, by the way, which conquistador conquered the Aztecs? Conquer, in parentheses. Cortez. Cortez, yeah. I mean, by conquer, we mean got them sick on accident. Oops. All right. 
Incans, a lot more developed than the Aztecs. Aztecs, fantastic militaristically. Incans, also probably fantastic militaristically, but they're much more known for, known for how they ran governments. Like, they ran a government like as good or better than some of the classical empires, um, uh, like Rome or Persia. So they conquered people as well, but they did a much better job of incorporating conquered people. What area were they in, by the way, in the Americas? Yeah, the Andes about they're actually going to pretty much connect South America almost tip to tip, which is pretty ridiculous. So they're going to uh, conquer and incorporate all the peoples they conquer. They, in fact, have the first state-run economy where they choose what you do, what you make, and how much you're paid. The only way you can keep the stuff... What? What? Yeah, the meta system. I think you said something about Buddhism. Yeah, that's the meta system. Correct. Uh, they have the first state-run economy, and that's where they pick what you do, how much you're paid, and how much you make. The only way you can keep stuff is if you're making it privately at home, which they allow you to do. Uh, and they have that state-run economy. That's, again, called the Amita system. Who borrows this later when they show up? You're right, the Spanish. Well done. Because the Incans already have it like laid out so organized. They're just like, well, we may as well just keep using this. So they do. All right. Um... The Incans are also extremely good record keepers. They have a, I see it feels like a quipos or a queen, I can't remember what it's called. The thing that they, they keep track of records with strings, it's pretty crazy actually. Yeah, keep quipos. They are great record keepers. Record keepers. They have these things called uh, quipos or quipos that are like these long strings, these sections of strings they used to count and add and keep track of records. It's pretty ridiculous. They're great record keepers and bureaucrats. They were so uh, intricate, they even had death certificates. Like, they knew when people died and when. And that's pretty, uh, pretty damn advanced and amazing for uh, any, any empire back then to have. Did they have uh, records of when people got married, too? Yeah, they did. They had marriage, birth. It was either marriage or birth certificates. I can't remember which. It might have been birth certificates, but uh, either way. They had either birth or marriage certificates and death certificates. So they were very specific on, on, on when people died and how much stuff you had. Because uh, why do you think they need to have so much control or knowledge of how much stuff you have and you make? They were such a large empire. Okay, because they're such a large empire, but what is their economic system that requires them to know these things? Uh, it's state-run. Yeah, it's state-run. That media system. They've got to know what you're making, how much. They have to have good records for that. Okay. And then I think I want to add one more part. Oh, yeah. What was their capital city? Cusco. Oh, come on, I can forget. What's that? What's that? Emperor's New Groove movie? Yeah. That was his name. Like, that's, that's Cusco. Yeah. That is the capital city from the uh, Peruvian highlands, which is where these uh, Incans came from originally. And, of course, what's going to end their uh, empire? Bizarre with the Spanish and disease, and also infighting with the other tribes they took over. Because, I mean, they expanded so much, man, like, it's really hard to hold on to that. Did they have roads? Yes. They did. Yep, they had roads, too. Roads and gover governor-like officials. So, again, just think of what Persia and Rome were like, as far as, like, how they set it up with governors and bureaucrats. And that's, that's the Incans, so it's pretty easy to remember it, at least I think with that in mind. So, who's conquest-based? Aztecs. Aztecs. Are they the ones that have the alive? Yeah, they are. We'll get to the, that. You know, I may as well mention that now, actually. So, the Andes Mountains would get a lot of seasonal flooding, and it would, like, wash away a lot of their crops. And also, it was hard to hold on to that water. So, these, uh, these people of, at least in South America over here, I don't know the Incans specifically, but over here in the Andes region, they develop a whole new agricultural style that not only allows the water to run under the stuff they're growing, but they're also able to keep the water in those channels for irrigation. You guys remember what that system was called? Water, 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 water yeah. Waru, waru, agricultural system. And again, if you forgot that, what that looked like from the side, it would look like this. So they had like these tiny little mounds, and they would grow their stuff on top of these mounds. So when the water came down, it would run through these channels, not mess up the, the uh, plants, and they could keep some of that water too for later. That's water, water. Do you guys remember what it was called when they learned how to 
level out parts of the hills like steps so they could plant on hillsides. Terracing. Yeah, terracing. That allows them to use way more land than they could before. Um, and that's, that's all over the world, actually. So that's a period three. In fact, I'm going to actually put these all together. So agricultural advances. So I've got Chinampas, right, that's the Aztecs. I've got Waru Waru, and that's in the Andes region, Incas, Incans. I've got uh, Terracing, that's pretty much everywhere. And for those of you that forgot, and the internet, if I had a hillside, I could not grow stuff on it, because it would just fall down and be washed off. But they figured out, if I take this hill, which I could not use for agriculture before, and I just shave off flat portions of it like a step and make a hill like that. So now it's still a hill, but it's like, you know, a, like a step hill. Now I can grow things on these uh, flat plains. It's called terracing. These are terraces as they go up. Um, so that's gonna allow them to use hill size now for agriculture, which I've never been able to do, which is, which is great. All right, two more things. They're going to um, <clears throat> also discover a new type of rice that takes less time to cultivate and is far more resistant to drought from Vietnam and bring it to China. Chompa rice. Chompa rice, yep. And that comes from uh, the uh, Chompa Empire. Ooh. Wait, ends up in China? Ends up everywhere, but yeah. China slash any national trade network. So that's going to boost the uh, population. All these are going to boost the population. We also have a, a period of time when it gets a little warmer, so it's easier for crops to grow and then grow longer. It's called the warming, warming period, medieval warming period. Yep. So the warming period. And we've also got people uh, that can uh, use plows a lot more easily for horses because they invent the horse collar as well. Horse collar is invented. So it's kind of like a yoke, but it's for horses. So better plowing. Of fields. All that's going to increase agricultural productivity. We almost done. By the way, I uploaded those. I told three people, but I forgot to tell four. I uploaded those um, review timelines. You guys need to look at at least a couple of those every single day up until the AP test. It's probably more important than uh, knowing what these things are is knowing when they are. It's at least as important. Like, yeah, you can't know when they are, not what they are. But knowing what they are is only as good as knowing when they are in this test. Because you're going to get documents and questions that have, like, these time, like, these years on them. They're not going to be worded, like, in period three, blah, blah, blah. It's just going to be years. So you're going to have to know, like, oh... In the year 1000, like, oh, what did I have for agriculture? You're going to have to be able to talk about these. You're going to have to be like, oh, wait, where did I find it? Oh, right here. You're going to have to be able to, um, you're going to, have to, be, able to uh, be like, okay, what was, what was agriculture like in 1000, which is the post-classical era? And then you can talk about these. So you have to know when these things are. So I gave you timelines for world and euro. I would go through like three or four of those a day and make sure to uh, memorize them. Like, and I just mean straight, like you're taking a quiz on the next day or something. Just memorize, oh, my agriculture for period one, two, three, four, five, six, you know what, what it's like in each of those eras. Oh, my women's history for period one, two, three, four, five, six. Know what all of my major advancements for women and, and female figures are. So do a, a little bit of that every single day until the test, right? And that's called the, um, come on, brain. My brain is just failing right now. When you learn a little bit every day, it's from psych, I told this to you. Spacing effect, that's what it's called. Spacing effect. That's how you get things to stick in your brain, is you just review them a little bit each day for many days, and, and that, that sticks in your brain much better than cramming. So start doing that now. When you go home today, um, do the little reading I gave you if you haven't already, but also just go over a couple of those timelines until you know them, and then just do another couple the next day, another couple the next day. Because you still got like, what is this, 10? We still got like five weeks of the AP test ish so you've got plenty of time to uh to master those timelines and that's going to be the key all the kids from last year said that we had like what the 91 percent the past or whatever 
they all they are all pretty much saying like, wow, these timelines are what what are doing it. Like that was a huge help. So know them. Okay, as I run out of wind, we got technology, we got Americas, we got agriculture, we got Black Death, we got Mongols. Now we just have religion and migrations and you know, Sikhism, but that's a religion. Okay. So, <clears throat> where does Sikhism uh, appear? India. India, the Punjab region. It's a mix of uh, three different major religions. It pops up in the 1400s in the Punjab region of India, what is now today India anyway, and Pakistan. It is started by a guy named Guru Nanak. And um, what is this a, a mix of? What religions is, is this a mix of? Hinduism. 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 Buddhism. Buddhism and Islam, exactly. Uh, Islam because the Delhi Sultanate was there, Hinduism and Buddhism because India has been there for, for centuries at that point. So it's a, a, it's a syncretization of Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Here's how. It's monotheistic, or at least it believes in one creator. Right? Yep. Yes. yep. One creator. Monotheistic. Um, it is um, Hindu because it believes in the unity of all humanity. And it is Buddhist, at least in inspiration, because... Oh, I was doing this wrong. Buddhist because it is egalitarian. It also seeks social justice in response to the, the uh, caste system. So it believes that, you know, we should all be giving and we should uh, not try to, like, divide ourselves in hierarchies, essentially. So social justice. justice. Giving slash opposed to hierarchies. All right, and they're egalitarian and the unity of all human beings. So that's how these three religions influence Sikhism. Again, 1400s, India, Guru Nanak. All right, we have another religion, an old religion that spreads to Southeast Asia via trade. So Buddhism already spread. They have Theravada Buddhism there, and in case you forgot, that's that hardcore aesthetic left lifestyle where they deny themselves all like uh, worldly goods and things like that. What's the last religion to spread there? It's from India. Hinduism. Hinduism, yeah. I got two empires in Southeast Asia that just popped up besides this uh, Sri uh, Avaya Empire, which becomes Muslim, by the way. I've got one in what is now Cambodia and one is what is now Vietnam. You guys remember what they are? Champa and Vietnam. And Khmer, right? Yeah, we we say Khmer because we don't know, but apparently it's pronounced Khmer. So the Khmer, Khmer Empire, as well as the uh, Champ Empire. This is the modern day Vietnam, and this is modern day Cambodia. So Hinduism is going to spread via trade. to Southeast Asia. There's three reasons why it's so popular here. By the way, is Hinduism going to be popular among the poor and peasants or the uh, rich and ruling classes? Rich, rich and ruling. So which religion is going to be popular in Southeast Asia to the uh, poor and peasant classes? Buddhism. Buddhism, right? So we're going to have that dynamic here. The upper classes are definitely going to want uh, more, be more Hinduism favoring. And the lower class would be a lot more Buddhism favoring. Okay, so in the uh, Khmer here, in the Champa empires, we have them liking Hinduism, the leaders anyway, because it justifies their position. Leaders like due to Hinduism, justifying position. So according to Hinduism, are they supposed to be in control of people? They are, right? That's the caste system. Like, they did whatever in the past life, so that means that they are destined to rule in this life, and they're supposed to do it in order to go up. So that's a great reason to support it. It supports the hierarchy, right? That's what the Vedic people, or the Vedic religion, they came up with it for that reason, or liked it for that reason, because it supports the hierarchy. 
So, um, Ramin, why do uh, why do Hindu leaders uh, why do Khmer and uh, uh, Champa leaders like uh, this uh, Hinduism so much? Sorry, I fell asleep. I know. That's why I called on you. Somebody tell them. They justify their power. Justify their power. How does Hinduism justify their power? Yes, yeah, the caste system, right? That's what those castes are for. They're born into it and they're destined to rule and stay there. Okay. They also, it also comes from an ancient civilization that they really respect. What civilization does it come from? India, India right? Like at that point, India is at least three or four thousand years old as a civilization. Way older than these uh, two new empires, which are brand new, by the way, in uh, period three. So they're looking at a three or four thousand year old civilization. Of course, they're going to take their culture and their religion and see it as something that is great and old and fantastic. So they, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Admired Indian culture. And yeah, they liked the Hindu deities like the Shiva. So those are your three reasons. They liked it because it justified their position. They admired Indian culture, and they liked the deities of Hinduism, like the Shiva and the other one whose name I forgot. So my brain is running on fumes. Actually, my brain was running on fumes an hour ago. I don't know what my brain's running on now. I haven't, I haven't had time to, down, to download. See, I can't see. I haven't had time to, I had time to digest the, the pizza yet. I mean, your brain functions like a PC anyway, so you can really just say download. <laughs> awesome. Sorry, I'm only at 60%. Yeah. They liked them. They quit like. Yeah, the, uh, the uh, rulers really admired and liked the uh, Hindu deities, like the Shiva and others. Oh, man. We just gotta finish. Okay, so that's religion, that's Sikhism. Sweet, that paper's done. And now we've got, we did technology. All right, so. I know, we can do it. We have one migration we didn't talk about. It's people who started in Taiwan. And went to, yeah, the Philippines, and then to Indonesia, and then to New Zealand, and then all the way over to Madagascar and Africa. They brought with them animals, uh, and they brought with them coconuts and bananas. And language. And language. Who are those people? Polynesian. The Polynesian migration, yeah. <laughs> Good, because you are one. So that's basically Oceania. Madagascar, New Zealand. That's the last place on Earth settled, by the way, was New Zealand in the 1300s. Uh, Oceania, um, what did I just write here? Madagascar, New Zealand, Africa. Well, mostly Madagascar. And they brought with them, of course, animals, language, uh, coconuts, and bananas. <laughs> hey, man, that's how you get the coconuts and bananas in Madagascar. The Bantu people did too, but they helped settle it. Okay, um, we've got also. Women's rights in this period. So, got a couple good opportunities for women. So, women. We've got, um, in Islam, it's really a very patriarchal institution, or, or religion. But, in some Islamic areas, women start getting, getting the right to divorce their husbands. Initiate a divorce, maybe if they cheated or whatever. And that's called the kula. In Christianity, women are able to join convents as nuns, and that way they can escape um, uh, the, the, the traditional role of being a, a, a wife and mother if they want to, right? So there's an opportunity for women to join convents. It's very egalitarian. Um, also, in Japan, and with the pastoralists, women have more opportunity because pastoralists are naturally a little bit more egalitarian. Women are a lot more involved, like they have to help 
gather and move things and build things, etc., as these pastoralists move. Uh, and the Japanese, do they accept all of Confucianism? No. 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 And they also take some Buddhism. So Buddhism actually is going to boost a little bit the egalitarian views on women. So is Buddhism, Buddhist influence going to... Buddhist influence. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so the influence of those Turks and Mongols actually does improve, at least overall, by a little bit, the, uh, the rights of women. Alright, that's women. And now labor, I think that's it. Hey, I'm more excited than you are. Seriously, I am. I'm more excited than you are. I can't show anything right now. I have no energy. Alright, so... I forgot to. All right, so. <laughs> uh, in West Africa. Even Batuta discovers that women have a lot more freedom. So they're a lot less scantily clad, they have a lot less clothes on, and they, uh, they have a much less binding monogamy. They have more companionships. So they're able to have like more loose, not I want to say they all have multiple partners, but they're not as like limited to one. Uh, it's not as constricting or patriarchal as they, what they would say. They have more sexual freedom. Now, so West Africa, you have more sexually free companions. And lastly, in the Americas, you have a belief called gender parallelism. And that is the, that is not the word parallelism. <laughs> problem, parallelism. Gender problem. There you go. So gender, gender parallelism, that's going to be the idea that, yes, Men do certain things and women do certain things, but do they see one as superior or better? No. no, they see them as both essential. So it's like, okay, women worship the moon and they generally stay with the children and stay at home and do the gathering, but do you need all those things to continue society and live? Yes. You do. And the men worship like the sun and they run maybe the military and the state and religion, etc. Uh, but you also need those to have a functional society. So clearly different, but they see those roles as both necessary uh, and, uh, and equal. Different but equal, I guess you would say. Uh, that's what gender parallelism is. And that's going to be in America, is, by the way. So different but equal roles. Oh, now I can do labor. We can be done. Labor. We've got some coerced labor here. So we've got peasants in Europe, in China. Is that coerced? Do they have a choice? No, they do not. We also have uh, slave laborers in the Mongolian and Aztec uh, empires. They take people as tribute and slaves and use them in their military. So we've got Mongol slash Aztec tributes. Tribute, slaves, and soldiers. We have corvée labor. What's corvée labor? Labor for taxes, absolutely. Do we have a rebellion due to this uh, overly taxed covert, la covert corvée labor? Yeah, Vassal the Copperhand in the uh, Byzantine Empire in the 900s. Okay. And it might be. Go home. <gasps> Just in time.